board online, board offline. Today we're bringing you a how to play video for the King's Abbey. Now the King's Abbey is an 11th century abbey building game, which as I've said before, is a very specific genre of games. But it is a game that is uh, for 14 plus on the age range, which I'd say is probably about right. One to five players and 90 to 180 minutes expected playtime according to the box. Now my plays average an hour and 22 minutes. However, I have been playing solo only with this game. So that's something you should keep in mind when determining the if the length of the game is appropriate for your group. So without anything else, let's learn how to play the King's Abbey. A player will win the King's Abbey if she has the most prestige at the end of seven rounds. Players gain prestige by constructing buildings, towers, and walls, finishing crusades, and fighting Vikings. Keep in mind the game comes with these quick play rules that the game recommends players use for their first game. The main effect of these rules is to slightly decrease the difficulty of the game, but I'll be explaining the standard setup of the game in this video. Place the main board in the center of the play area. Next, place the wood, grain, stone, and sand resource tokens on their respective locations on the main board. Place the coins in the center market. Place the darkness tracker on the bottom three of the darkness track for the basic game, or on the next three for a more challenging game. Shuffle the six initiative tokens and place them face down in the space that says initiative resource pile. Each player takes a player board, one wagon, and one tool bag. Each player takes 15 peasants, an altar token, a defense tracker, two trade tokens, and five wall pieces. Each player also receives two battlements, one bell tower, two gate towers, and a chapel. These cards will have the player's color on the background of the back of the card. Each player also receives four coins, one wood, one grain, and one stone, which are placed in their designated spaces at the bottom of each player's individual player board. Next, all players place one peasant in the leftmost pew. Each player places a purple clergy training marker to the right of the first box of the postulant column. Each player then collects nine dice in their color, leaving the tenth one in the general supply. This tenth die will only be used when the monk's quarters is built and has a working peasant. Each player should make sure that her defense tracker is on the level one space if she hasn't already done so. No matter what, players will always have at least one defense in their abbeys. Locate the six starting building cards and deal one randomly to each player. The remaining starting building cards are returned to the box. Each player will then take her starting building card and place it on her player board in one of the seven building spots. Each player then takes one of her peasants and places it on this spot on her starting building card. When a peasant is placed on a building in this way, it represents that a peasant is working in that building. The starting building will be the first activated building for the player and its special ability will be active because it has a peasant working in it. Normally when a building is built, the player will earn prestige which will be located in this box. However, as you can see, none is earned for the starting building. We'll discuss more about building cards a little later in this video. The remaining building cards are shuffled and then placed into two evenly sized draw piles in the building market where it says draw pile. The players then deal three cards underneath each draw pile in the indicated spaces and flip over the top card of each draw pile. These eight cards are known as the building market. The players shuffle the crusade cards, deal one to each player, and place the remaining crusade cards face down in a deck in the indicated space. Each player then places her crusade card face up next to her player mat in clear view of the other players. Now players will need to set up the event deck. Event cards have this event back on them and first need to be separated into Disaster, Vikings, and Year of Plenty. Shuffle each type of event card 
and then deal two Year of Plenty cards, two Disaster cards, and three Viking cards into a single pile. Now shuffle those cards and place the pile face down on the main board in the designated location. The remaining event cards are placed back in the box and will not be used this game. Next players each roll a die to see who goes first. The player with the lowest roll becomes the starting player. She takes the starting player purple meeple and places her prestige tracker on the number five on the prestige track. Play will proceed clockwise around the table beginning with the starting player and each other player now places their prestige tracker in player order on the six, seven, and so on. So if the red player was next in player order, despite what was rolled here, the red player would place her tracker on the six and the blue player would place his tracker on the seven. And that's the setup. Now, before we get into the phases of play, let's discuss some tokens and cards that players should be familiar with. A tool bag may be used once per round. If a player has more than one, they may each be used once. Each tool bag used will allow a player to roll one of her dice up one pip as long as that die is being used for a resource spot. Players may use as many tool bags as they own on a single resource spot, or they may use them separately at different resource spots. No die may ever be increased above six. A wagon may be used one time and then it is discarded. Each wagon used allows a player to gain one extra resource token from the resource spot where they have placed one or more dice. A player may use as many wagons as she owns on one spot or she may spread it around. Each player has two trade tokens which are used to help players keep track of their maximum two trades per round. Players are allowed to make a trade at any time during the round. When making a trade, players always exchange one type of resource for one other type of resource. Players make trades based on the value of the resources shown at the bottom of the player boards as well as on the main board itself. Trades must always be made for equal or greater value. For example, if a player had this one stone, she could trade it in for two wood, since the wood are of equal value. However, if the player had this one grain, she could trade that in for only one wood, even though there's still one value remaining in that trade. Players do not receive any sort of change for making a trade like this. When a player makes a trade, she turns over her trade token to indicate that trade has been used for the round. It's important to note that coins are not considered a resource, but still may be traded for resources. We've mentioned defense a few different times at this point, so let's talk about it a little bit more in depth. As previously mentioned, each player's abbey will always have at least one defense. After building certain towers and buildings and activating those towers or buildings with peasants, players must check to see if they have gained any defense from them and adjust their defense tracker accordingly. Most of the time, defense will be noted by this symbol. There are five main ways for a player to increase her abbey's defense. The first way is to build an altar. This is done during the build phase and costs the player four coins and two wood, as you can see here. After paying the cost, the player places the abbey token in her abbey and then gains one defense. Placing an archer in a tower is another way a player may increase her abbey's defense. Like building an altar, this is also done during the build phase. The player training the archer must first pay five coins and then take a peasant from either the pews or the baptistry and place it on this space of the tower. Once the archer is placed, the player then gains the defense listed on the card. Unlike peasants in other buildings and the bell tower, archers do not need to be baptized. Using dice is another way players may increase their defense. Since dice represent monks, they can be used to defend the player's abbey. 
During phase three, the player may place as many dice as she wants on her defense track to the right of her defense tracker token. Each die placed in this way increases the overall Abbey defense by one. Keep in mind the dice are only a temporary fix and will be taken back into the player's personal supply during the reset phase. Players may build wall sections at a cost of one stone per wall section. Once all five wall sections are built, the wall has been completed and the player immediately gains both eight prestige and one defense. It's important to note that a partially built wall provides no benefit whatsoever since it's really just sad. Finally, constructing certain buildings is the other way players may increase their defense. Certain buildings, such as the barracks, will increase defense when they're occupied by a peasant. Let's take a closer look at exactly what players will find on tower and building cards. The name of the building or tower is found here. A peasant is placed in this space in order to activate the card's special ability. If the meeple silhouette is surrounded by blue, as you see here, then the peasant must be baptized to work here. This number represents the amount of prestige a player gains simply by building the card. The cost to build the card is located here. The special ability of the card is found here. Remember that these special abilities are only activated once a peasant is working at this building. And finally, at the bottom right corner of buildings, players will find the reward they receive immediately upon purchasing the card from the building offer. Now let's take a look at the player board. These four spaces are available for constructing tower cards. These seven spaces are available for constructing building cards. This is where the altar is placed when built, as you've seen. These are where the wall sections are built. Players track their defense here. Players track their clergy training in this grid. And extra resources are stored by players in this section of the board. The King's Abbey is played over seven rounds, and each round is broken into 12 phases. In phase one, all players roll their dice. The dice represent the monks that are recruiting peasants, training clergy, defending the abbey, going on crusades, fighting Vikings, and collecting resources. In phase two, players draw an event card. The starting player draws the event card and reads it out loud to the rest of the table. In this case, each player may build one building for free, must have the building already in their personal supply before phase seven. If on the first round of play and only on the first round of play, a Vikings card is drawn, it is placed at the bottom of the deck and then another card is drawn. This procedure is followed until a non-Viking card is drawn. Anytime a Disaster or Year of Plenty card is drawn, the player simply reads it out loud and the instructions are followed and that card is in effect until the end of the round. Vikings cards are an entirely different animal. These cards represent bands of Vikings attacking each player's abbey. Players will have to work together to defeat the Vikings. When a Vikings card is drawn, the last player takes as many black dice as there are players and rolls them. She then takes those dice and places them in descending order in the squares provided. Next, the first player must take one of her dice that matches the first black die on the top of the column and place it next to it in the space provided. By doing so, that player immediately gains one prestige. She then may choose to place an additional die that matches the next die down if she wishes. If she does so, she again gains one prestige point, and if she doesn't place a die, then play continues to the next player. That player follows the same procedure. If, on the other hand, a player is unable to place at least one die, and the Vikings have not been defeated due to other players playing multiple dice, then she must permanently lose one peasant from her abbey and place it in the space that she would have placed a die. That player also loses one prestige point. Now let's say for a moment that the red player did not have a die matching this black six. If the red player had to place a peasant on the Vikings card and of course lose one prestige point, but then she did have a red one, that player will be unable to play the matching red one. Once a player has placed 
a peasant on the Vikings card, she cannot place any further dice on that card. This procedure is repeated in turn order for each player until all players have had at most one turn. Since players can place more than one die on their turn, it's possible the Vikings will be resolved prior to all players having a turn. Once all the appropriate spaces on the Vikings card have either a peasant or a monk assigned to them, the battle is over. If the players have assigned more dice than cubes, then the battle is won and the Vikings have been defeated. When the Vikings are defeated, the player with the most dice assigned to the card receives an additional three prestige. If two players are tied, as you see in this case, neither earns the prestige. If, on the other hand, there are more cubes than dice, the players have lost the battle. That card is discarded into the box and any peasant assigned to it is also lost. If that building was a farm, then not only is the farm lost, but so is the barn associated with it. Any sheep or cows in the barn are placed back into the general supply. If a player had no constructed buildings or towers, she instead would lose all of her current resources and coins. It's important to understand that players may not choose this loss, however. If a player has buildings or towers to lose, she must lose that. Whether or not players defeat the Vikings, the card remains in place with the assigned dice and cubes until the reset phase. Phase three is the Abbey and Crusade dice placement phase. In this phase, players will put their monks to work in the Abbey and going off on Crusades. It's important for players to remember that once they place their dice in this round, those dice will remain where they are until the reset phase. To successfully build the most prestigious Abbey, players are going to want to recruit more peasants. To recruit peasants, a player may select up to three dice with the values one, two, or three, and place them to the left of the pews in the area with the dice picks that are already printed on the player mat. That player then collects a number of peasants equal to the number of dice placed, and these peasants are placed in the pews filling in from bottom to top and left to right. Each player is allowed to use up to three dice per round to train clergy. Training clergy will provide the player with various bonuses. There are five levels of clergy training. Postulant, deacon, priest, bishop, and cardinal. Players complete each level when they reach the top space of a column. As soon as a player completes a level, she receives the indicated bonus. Upon completing the postulant level, the player receives two extra peasant moves for the rest of the game. Players move their peasants during phase six, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. When the deacon level is completed, the player receives a permanent defense for her abbey. When the priest level is completed, the player gains two resources of her choice once and may also gain one permanent defense if she has built the chapel. Players will note the chapel does not require a working peasant and so the defense is gained as soon as the priest training is completed. At the bishop level, the player receives three more peasant moves for the rest of the game, bringing her total peasant moves per turn to six. The player also receives four prestige as indicated by the top space. Once a player begins training on the cardinal level, the player receives the prestige at each square as she moves up the column. So one prestige, two prestige, and three prestige. Once the player completes the cardinal training, she also receives one permanent defense. Now that we've discussed the Abbey portion of Phase 3, let's discuss the Crusade portion. Each Crusade card represents a crusade that the monks and peasants from the player's Abbey are currently on. These two boxes are the spaces where peasants may be placed. These boxes indicate the number of dice, monks, that must be used to complete the quest. All dice used on a crusade must be of the same value. At the bottom of the crusade card, the players will find the rewards and prestige earned for completing the crusade. In this case, one stone resource and two movements on the clergy track. To begin a crusade, the player takes one peasant from her pew or baptistry and places it on one of the two designated spaces. The other space is there in case another player wishes to assist on the crusade. There may never be more than two players on one crusade. Peasants placed in this way must stay on this card until the crusade has been either completed or abandoned. 
Once this player has placed her peasant, she then places a die of any value on one of the designated squares. All other dice assigned to this crusade by this player or another player must match the value of the first die assigned. A player may place as many dice as she wishes during this phase to the crusade card. Dice assigned to an uncompleted crusade remain on the crusade until it is completed. Once all of the squares have dice assigned to them, the crusade is completed and the player or players will collect the reward in phase 11. Sometimes, as has been mentioned, a player may request assistance on a crusade from another player. Let's say that this red player wanted help completing the crusade. As you can see, she only needs one more four. She requests assistance from another player. In this case, let's say it's the blue player. And the blue player says he's willing to help under certain conditions. The red player agrees to those conditions and so the player she requested assistance from places one of his peasants on the empty peasant space. He then places one of his four value dice on the empty space. The conditions set forth when making an agreement to help on a crusade are up to the players but may only consist of the rewards listed on the crusade card itself. On occasion, a player may wish to take her dice back from a crusade. If she does this, it must occur during the reset phase. The owner of the crusade must remove all dice from the crusade, returning each of them to their rightful owner. The peasants must also be removed. However, these peasants are considered lost and are discarded into the box for the rest of the game. The player must then restart this crusade by placing dice and a peasant as previously detailed. In phase 11, if the crusade is complete, then both the dice and the peasants return to their owners. In phase four, players are able to purchase buildings. Once players have all finished placing dice on their abbey and crusades, they enter phase four and it's time to purchase building cards. Beginning with the starting player, players take turns in clockwise order, either passing or selecting one building card at a time and paying the purchase price. When the last player selects a building card, the players each have the opportunity to purchase a building card one more time, but this time in reverse player order. To purchase a building card, the player must pay the indicated price, either one, two, three, or four gold. If a player chooses to pass rather than purchase a building card, she may not go back and purchase one again this round. When a building card is purchased, the purchasing player immediately takes the reward indicated in the bottom right of the card. So, if a player paid one gold to purchase the dairy farm, she would then also immediately gain the one grain indicated at the bottom. The purchased building is then placed in the player's personal supply to be built at a later time. Keep in mind that any building that remains unbuilt in a player's personal supply at the end of the game becomes negative prestige points. Also, pages 18 and 19 of the rulebook have detailed descriptions of each building. The fifth phase is the resource and initiative selection phase. In turn order, each player places a die on either the initiative spot or one of the resource spots. A player chooses a single space and then play proceeds in turn order until either all dice have been placed or all players have passed. Players have access to four different resources in the game. Wood, grain, stone, and sand. Each of these resources are important for the construction of various buildings, towers, and different parts of the abbey. Each resource is valued based on the number found next to its resource spots on the board. These numbers are also located at the bottom of the player boards, as previously mentioned. It's also important to note that coins are not considered a resource and have a value of one. Each resource spot has seven squares, five regular squares, and two bonus squares. When a player places her die on a resource spot, she must place a single die on a regular empty resource spot. She may not place a single die on a bonus square. However, if a player wishes to place two dice on a single resource spot, she may only do so if there is an available bonus square. The player must then place both the dice at the same time. After placing a die or dice on a resource spot, the player then immediately receives the associated resource. The amount the player receives depends on the total value of the dice just placed. She divides that value 
by the number indicated next to the resource spot. So in this case, seven divided by two is three and a half. So the player receives three wood resources. A player does not collect change in the case of overpaying for a resource. Players should remember that all dice used in this phase must stay on the board until retrieved during phase 12. It's also important to realize that there is a three resource limit on each resource at the end of phase 12. But there is no such limit on gold. Instead of placing a die on a resource spot, the player may instead place it on the board in the space above the word initiative. In doing so, the player first takes the top token from the pile and gains the indicated reward. Only one die may be in this space at a time, and it is legal for a player to place her die there even if she already has the first player token. Phase six is the move peasants phase. Each player starts the game with one peasant move at the beginning of the game. For each peasant move a player has, she may move a peasant one space to the right in an effort to get the peasants to the baptistry. If a player has multiple peasant moves, then she can spend all of those moves to move one peasant multiple times or split them up amongst her available peasants. So if a player had three peasant moves because the postulant training has been completed, then she can move this peasant one space and then perhaps this peasant two spaces. To move a peasant, there must be an empty space immediately to the right of it. Peasants may not jump over other peasants. As soon as a peasant reaches the front row, the player may then immediately move that peasant to the baptistry for free. That is, of course, assuming there is an empty baptistry space. Having peasants in the baptistry is the only way a player may activate the buildings she's built that require a baptized peasant. To activate a building, simply move a peasant from the baptistry to the building. Moving a peasant from the baptistry to the building is a free move. Once the peasant is placed in the building, that building's bonus is now activated. Peasants may also be moved from the baptistry to a tower. But remember, archers, such as for the gate tower, do not need to be baptized, but they can be. And keep in mind the bell tower peasant does need to be baptized. Once a peasant is assigned to a building, that peasant cannot be moved unless they are killed in some unfortunate event. Phase seven is the build phase. During the build phase, players may now build the different buildings, towers, altars, and walls of their abbeys. This is also the phase where players may train archers. Since this phase is entirely free of any interaction between the players, players may feel free to resolve this phase simultaneously amongst themselves. It's also important for players to remember that during the build phase, it is possible to build two of the same kind of any building they build, with the exception of sheep and dairy farms. As mentioned before, page 18 and 19 of the rulebook do describe all the buildings in detail. They also describe the benefits of building two of the same kind of building. In order to construct a building or tower, the player must currently have that building already in her personal supply. The player then pays the indicated resources and coins listed on the card, in this case, one wood, two grain, and one stone, and then places the card on any legal empty space on her player board. The resources and coins used to pay for the building are placed back into the general supply on the board. Immediately upon constructing the building, the player gains the indicated prestige points. If the player has a peasant in the baptistry, it may be moved immediately onto this new building. This will of course cause that building's bonus to activate. If a player manages to fill all seven empty spaces, she may take the remodel card, assuming she has the necessary resources to build it. The player then places the remodel card next to her player board, opening up two new spaces for buildings. A player may never buy more than one remodel card in a game. As I mentioned before, walls and altars are also built during this phase, and archers are trained during this phase. However, I discussed that in detail previously in the defense section of this video, so if you missed that, skip back to that using the timestamp. Phase 8 is the gardening, farming, and feeding phase. 
During phase eight, if a player has a garden built, as you see here, with a working peasant, she may collect one grain for every three grain she already has. So in this case, the player would gain no additional grain. However, if the player had three grain, she would simply add one additional grain to her stock. If a player has a dairy farm or a sheep farm with a working peasant, then in this phase, she may collect one cow or one sheep, respectively. In this game, the cows are brown cubes and the sheep are white cubes. When a cow or sheep is collected, it is placed on the barn, not directly on the dairy farm. Keep in mind, if this is the first round the dairy farm or sheep farm was activated, then the player must wait until the next round to receive her first animal. A barn may hold up to three cows or five sheep. After gardening and farming, players then feed their peasants by returning grain resource tokens to the field resource spot. Each player must pay one grain for each level of peasant population in her abbey. If the player has one to four peasants in her abbey, she must pay one grain, five to eight peasants, two grain, and nine or more peasants, three grain. As you can see here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six peasants. That falls into the five to eight level and so we'll need to pay two grain to feed our peasants. However, cows and sheep can also assist in feeding peasants. If a player were to discard a sheep, that would feed eight peasants. If a player instead has cows, she may feed four peasants for every one cow she owns and does not have to discard the cow. So in this case, up to 12 peasants could be fed with these cows. It's important to remember when counting up the number of peasants for feeding, the clergy training marker does not count. If a player is unable to feed all of her peasants, for each level she's unable to feed, she must lose one peasant and also two prestige points. So in this case, with six peasants and only one grain, I'm missing one grain to feed all of them. And so I'll have to pay this grain and then lose two prestige points and lose one peasant from the board. Phase nine is the combat darkness and move darkness phase. When phase nine arrives, players must have enough defense to combat the current darkness level. The darkness represents things like depression, famine, raiders attacking, and other horrors that the dark ages brought with it. The player's defense must be equal to or greater than the current darkness level. If a player is unable to gain enough defense in a round to at least match the current darkness level, so as you see here, the darkness level is four and the defense is three, for each unmatched darkness level, the player will lose one peasant permanently, which must be placed back into the box, as well as two prestige points. The player gets to choose which pew, building, or tower the lost peasants are taken from, but peasants may not be taken from a crusade or Vikings cards. Once each player has attempted to combat the darkness, the darkness tracker is moved up one space. In phase 10, players collect income. The player earns coins for peasants in her pews, baptistry, buildings, and towers. Peasants on Vikings cards and crusade cards do not earn income. For each valid peasant, the player earns one coin. So in this case, one, two, three, four, five coins. In phase 11, players collect the crusade rewards and purchase new crusades. First, players will collect the rewards at the bottom of the crusade card, splitting them up if necessary in the case of a crusade completed by two players, or taking them all for themselves otherwise. If the crusade was completed without assistance, then the player will flip the crusade card face down and keep those prestige points hidden until the end of the game. If the crusade was completed on the other hand with the assistance of another player, then the prestige points are immediately split up and scored as was previously agreed upon and the card is discarded. Remember, if a player has any incomplete crusades at the end of the game, the prestige points on the card become negative points and the player must subtract them from her total. Once all rewards have been distributed, the player may now purchase a new Crusade card. Crusade cards are purchased in player order, and to purchase a Crusade card, the player spends one coin and then takes the top Crusade card from the deck.
A player may only purchase at most one Crusade card per round and may never have more than two active Crusades at a time. At the beginning of the reset phase, if a player placed one of her dice on the initiative space, she now collects the starting player meeple. If no one used the initiative space, then the starting player maintains the starting player meeple. All players then collect their dice from the main board, their player boards, Viking cards, and completed crusades. Any peasants that were placed on the Viking cards are removed from the game and placed back in the box. Next, players remove the bottom card from each column of the building market and then move all remaining buildings as far down their respective columns as possible. Finally, players refill the building market columns. Next, players check to see if they have any more than three of each type of resource. If a player sees that she does have more than three resources and she still has trades available, she may take this opportunity to trade in the excess resources. However, any excess resources not traded in will be lost. Now, if this is not the final round of the game, all players reset their tool bags, reset their trade tokens, and then begin phase one of the next round. If this is the final round of the game, then players move on to end game scoring. During end game scoring, players score prestige for all of their face down crusade cards. They then score two prestige for each sheep they own or three prestige for each cow. If a player built two money changer buildings and currently has a peasant working in it, she receives one prestige for every five coins in her supply. A player with a second tithe barn with a working peasant receives one prestige for every three resources in her personal supply. Finally, a player who has unbuilt buildings and incomplete crusades must subtract their respective prestige points from her score. And at that point, whoever has the most prestige points is the winner. If there's a tie, the player with the most resources is the winner. And if there's still a tie, the players share the win. There are also variants to make the game easier and more difficult, two included expansions, and also solo rules. But I'll leave all of that for you to discover on your own. And that's how you play The King's Abbey. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful and helpful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. If you like my channel, consider subscribing. You'll find me over on Twitter, at Board Offline. And until next time, if you're bored online, Board Offline.